Well, good morning. Welcome to Sunday school class in this strange new world that we live in. Um, I'm privileged to lead one of the Sunday school classes here at uh, here at First Baptist in Republic, and uh, we are presently involved in a study of the Book of Romans. Uh, several other uh, classes also meet on a uh, regular basis on Sundays, and they. Uh, uh, at least one other class is looking at Romans presently, uh, and I know one of the other classes has a different, uh, different Sunday School curriculum that they're following. Regardless of your class, I would encourage you to continue to follow up with your, uh, your uh, Sunday School curriculum each week. Prepare just as though you were going to Sunday School, and uh, definitely take advantage of those resources that you have at your disposal. Whether you actually have today's study of Romans or not, uh, I know we all have Bibles, and so if nothing else, you can turn to Romans uh, chapter 3 this morning to follow along with us as we're, uh, we're looking at today's lesson. Um, in our previous week's meeting here with this study of Romans, we've spent time in chapters 1 and 2 of Paul's letter. Uh, in penning this letter to the Romans, Paul wanted to share the good news that is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, pared down to its very essence, the good news tells us that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. In order for people to appreciate the significance of Christ's death on the cross, they must first become aware of their sinful condition and therefore their need for a savior. The, uh, the author of our study provides us with a good context within which we'll be starting uh, today's lesson. He writes that Paul spent the first portion of his letter to the Romans explaining the dire spiritual situation of both Gentiles and Jews. The Gentiles ignored the truth of God by worshiping the creation instead of the Creator. The Jews considered themselves superior to the Gentiles but were just as separated from God by their sin. No one, whether they were Jews or Gentiles, could claim a righteous standing before God. It would seem the human race was trapped in a hopeless dilemma. We are all separated from God and incapable of restoring our relationship with Him on our own. Our actions could never be enough to pay for our offenses against Him. Last week, we studied Paul's remarks to the Jews, through which he hoped to jolt them out of their sense of pride in being a Jew, their sense of complacency towards God, and their failure to understand what God really desired from them. You see, Jews at that time considered themselves to be special because they were direct descendants of Abraham. They were recipients of God's law, the Torah. And as a result, they believed that they had special revelation intended only for them. And through this revelation could know God in a way that no other people groups could. And lastly, the Jewish people of that day bore the physical mark of circumcision, God's way of physically marking his people as being separate from those around them. As a result, Jews worshiped the law instead of the lawgiver. They believed that they were right and in right relationship with God based solely upon their genealogy. Paul sought to correct this, uh, this misunderstanding 
through Romans chapter 2, verses 28 and 29, where we see Paul write, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the Spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. With this background, uh, we find ourselves today in Lessons 4, titled Justified. And our author writes for us that all who accept the gospel by faith are justified before the Father. Now, our verses today are found in Romans chapter 3, starting at verse 21, and carrying on through chapter 4, verse 3. Now, in uh, verse 21 actually starts out by, with the words, but now. And of course, this phrase, but now, indicates that Paul is changing direction and emphasis at this point in his letter. In order for us to have an appreciation of what Paul's turning from and turning into, let's back up two verses just real quickly and take a look at uh, uh, Romans 3 verses 19 and 20. We see Paul writing, Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. With that understanding in mind, let's go ahead and uh, start reading Romans 3 verses 19 and 20, I'm sorry, 21 through 24, Romans 21 through 24. But now, apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been made known, to which the law and the prophets testify. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, and all are freely justified by his grace through the redemption that came by Jesus Christ. Notice in, uh, in verse 21, we actually see the word law used there a couple of different times. We see law, first of all, uh, being referred to as the law of righteousness with small letter L, and then later on we see the law referred to with a capital L, meaning the law and the prophets. Um, it's interesting to note that uh, when Paul uses law with the small letter L, He's referring to a guiding principle, a moral law, if you will, kind of uh, uh, things that guide people's uh, lives and, and how they go about living. Whereas when Paul uses the capital letter L, he's actually referring to God's law, the Ten Commandments and the other uh, laws and rules in the Torah that were revealed specifically to Israel. As we, uh, as we go back and look at verses 21 through 24, I think it's important for us to note that these laws have been made known by God. God has chosen to reveal these things to himself as a benefit to his people so that his people can know right from wrong and ultimately come to know the Lord. Um, it's important for us to understand that this law has been revealed from the very beginning, and indeed we'll see it throughout today's study that 
this plan of salvation that God has laid before us is one that is seen over and over again throughout the Old Testament. So when Paul refers to the law and the prophets, he's really talking to about the entire Old Testament, not only the Torah, but the compilation of the writings of the prophets. This righteousness is given through faith in Christ to all who believe. So the key that unlocks the knowledge of God's righteousness comes through Jesus Christ alone and is available to all who believe. Paul notes in, uh, in verse 22, there's no difference between Jew and Gentile, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Now this, this particular assumption would have been offensive to the Jews of, of his day because they did consider themselves to be a special people, a people set apart from the Gentiles, people who were God's special chosen people. And this would have been a stumbling block for the Jews of that time. But it was important that Paul made them aware that they all have sinned, whether they be Jew or Gentile, and have fallen short of the glory of God. While we've all fallen short, we all can be freely justified through the redemption that only comes through Jesus Christ. That only comes through Jesus Christ. And this was, this was a plan set in place before the beginning of time by God. It's interesting. Um, as I was preparing for class, I was looking at a couple of different commentaries, and one of the commentary writers actually noted that these verses that we're looking at today, specifically uh, 21 through 26, are so deep, so full of biblical truth, that you can almost spend your time studying these verses word by word by word, and unlocking truth, spiritual truths, in each word or each phrase, every coupling of two or three or four words, these are truly some of the most beautiful words in all of Scripture as they present to us what God has done for us through His Son, Jesus Christ. Let's go ahead and move on then to, uh, to verses 26 and 27 in our books. Uh, where we see Paul telling us that God presented Christ as a sacrifice of atonement through the shedding of his blood to be received by faith. He did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time so as to be just and the one who justifies those who have faith in Jesus. It's important for us to note that this plan of salvation is actually initiated by God himself. God presented Christ as a sacrifice of an atonement through the shedding of his blood. Now, the Jews of this day were obviously very familiar with the sacrificial system and the need to shed blood to make atonement for sin. They had the temple sacrifice system currently going on in Jerusalem at this time. It had been going on for centuries beforehand. And this was the only way that the people of that time knew to, to address their sins in an effort to make themselves right with a holy God. We see God presenting his only son on the, cry, on, on the cross, in essence on the sacrificial altar, and shedding his blood for all of us. Now, the shedding of blood is important because we've been told earlier in scripture that in blood is the life. Life exists in the blood and only through the shedding of blood can we experience 
a remission or a, or a forgiveness for our sins. God himself did this to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. Now that means that throughout history, before Christ's atoning sacrifice on the cross, the sins of the world had not been atoned for. And while people sought to know God, they could not do so. They could not ultimately approach him in a right way. We see Abraham, we see Isaac, we see Jacob, we see Moses, we see so many wonderful examples of good godly men who sought to know God and indeed came to know him and yet their sins had not been addressed up until this point in time. And God being a righteous God could not allow that to go unanswered. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and Jesus' atoning sacrifice on the cross addressed those issues that had to be resolved for a righteous God to remain righteous and holy and just. He also did this to justify all of those who came afterward, including us today, who have faith in Jesus to know that our sins are forgiven. And praise God for that. Moving on to, uh, to Romans 27 verses, uh, uh, what Romans 3, excuse me, verses 27 through 31, uh, we see Paul continuing, where then is boasting? Is it excluded? Because of what law? The law that requires works? No, because of the law that requires faith. For we maintain that a person is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of Jews only? Is he not the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too, since there is only one God who will justify the circumcised by faith and the uncircumcised through the same faith. Do we then nullify the law by this faith? Not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. Now, in verse 27, Paul talks about boasting. And this is actually something that the Jewish people of that time were doing. They were boasting that they had the law. And as a result, they could be right with God and uh, ultimately spend eternity with him because of their, their uh, lineage to Abraham, their knowledge of the law, and their physical circumcision. But Paul corrects them on this and says, by no means are you made righteous and whole by the law. The works of the law do not sanctify you and save you. The law does not ultimately address your sinful condition. The law points, uh, the, the, the law reveals your sinful condition to yourself, but it ultimately does nothing to provide an atoning sacrifice for your sins or reconnect yourself to the God from whom you've been separated. He again, he again points out that we are justified by faith alone and apart from the works of the law. He goes on to say, is God the God of Jews only? Or is he the God of Gentiles too? Yes, of Gentiles too. You see, when presented with this conundrum, Jews had to admit that there was only one God, one true God for the entire world. And while Gentiles may not have recognized that, Jews had to admit that there was only one God. Therefore, if there was only one God, that God must be a God not only for the Jews, but for the Gentiles as well. 
and that uh, and that the circumcision that they had physically was not enough to reconcile themselves to God. That whether one was circumcised or not, physically, true circumcision of the heart through faith could create that connection that was required uh, that everyone wanted to, uh, to renew their right relationship with the Lord. He goes on in 31 to write, do we then nullify the law by this faith? No, not at all. Rather, we uphold the law. You see, he was anticipating Jewish arguments that uh, if the law is no good, then, then how do we ultimately find a right relationship with God? They, could, they struggled with this concept of only having to have faith and not works. And they thought that this issue of faith without works nullified the law in its entirety. It's important for us to remember that Jesus said that he did not come to, uh, to do away with the law, but to actually uphold it and comply with its every provision. So in essence, what we see here with God's plan of salvation is the perfect completion of God's law. When we recognize that we cannot do anything to earn God's love, when we cannot ultimately be righteous enough in his sight to, to join ourselves back to him, then we come to the conclusion that we must fall at the foot of the cross and grasp hold of this sacrifice that Christ has made for us and in faith trust in that. The law points us to Christ on the cross and encourages us to claim this salvation we can only receive through him. Lastly, let's, uh, let's go to the final three verses of today's study where we, uh, we begin in chapter 4. Paul writes, What then shall we say that Abraham, our forefather according to the flesh, discovered in this matter? If, in fact, Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about, but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham loved God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Credited to him as righteousness. Our author of our study tells us that Paul affirmed that God justified Abraham by faith. By faith. To support that claim, he quoted Genesis 15, 6. Now, this would have been a troubling this actually would not have been something that the Jewish people would have thought of. Most Jewish people thought at that time that Abraham was made right with God through his works. And so Paul's emphasizing that no, Abraham's faith made him right with God would have been, a, would have been something that would have been difficult for the Jews to accept and comprehend. Our author continues to write, um, the apostle made it clear that Abraham chose to believe what God said even when it didn't make sense to him. That decision to believe, to live by faith, is what saved Abraham. Now using business terminology uh, that we might be familiar with today, Paul described the spiritual transaction that took place in Abraham's heart. He deposited his trust in God's words as demonstrated by his willingness to obey in faith. God recorded that faith as a credit to his account, much like we deposit money into our own bank accounts. Abraham's debt was paid in full by his faith in God, just as ours is paid through our faith. In Christ. Well, so what uh, what exactly have we learned today? Uh, as we uh, as we look again at some of our author's comments, 
uh, he has a good way of really boiling this down for us. He writes that Paul turned an important corner in Romans chapter 3. While all have sinned and are separated from God, God has provided a way of salvation. The way is by acknowledging God's grace and coming to him through faith in Christ. Instead of relying on our own efforts, we need to look toward the finishing work of Jesus on the cross. This means two things. First, humans have no reason to brag about their own spirituality. Jesus is our only hope. Second, God offers to open up to anyone who is willing to accept it by faith alone, this special gift of grace. If the Jews would look back at their history, this would be evident. Their patriarch Abraham was redeemed by faith long before Moses received the law on Mount Sinai. Now, David also recognized the importance of faith, as Paul emphasized later in a quote from the book of Psalms. But Abraham understood what was truly needed. Instead of trusting in circumcision or some other legal restraint, faith remains the only option. His faith in God was made, is what made him righteous and is what would make his descendants righteous as well. Well, thank you for, uh, for joining us today for our study in the book of Romans. Um, my prayer for us is that uh, we might always remember the wonderful gift that God has given us through his son, Jesus Christ, and his atoning sacrifice on the cross. Praise be to God and our Father, now and forever.